Alright, hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the stream. This is uh, Diagnose Your Chess, episode 5. And uh, today I am with Henry Hughes, who is from Canada. And uh, we were just talking, rating around like 1760 CFC, but Lee Chess is like a little bit higher, right? Like around 2000, you'd say? Yeah, like 2000-ish, 2100 rapid, but I haven't touched that in a while because I want to keep it there, but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like 2000-ish classical. Cool. Yeah, like everyone's ratings are just jumbled up because of COVID. And, I know. Yeah. Um, I haven't played a tournament, as I said, when before the stream started, like 16 months, I think. Uh -huh. And I went from playing, you know, 12 to 15 a year to none. It's just crazy. Right, right, right. So, yeah, well, so this is the show where we kind of, um, we, we go into it and we talk about someone's chess and, and take a look at some uh, recent games. Um, I've known Henry for a little bit through the Dojo, Discord, and, and Twitch. Um, but this will be the first time that we like kind of you know interact and uh, actually break yeah, down. Sure. I've seen a few of your games from uh, the streams, like Sunday Night Fights and stuff. So I I feel yeah, like I have a I'm little. Bit... <laughs> right, I've got a little bit of like a sense of of where you're at, but it would be good to kind of like pick your brain and um, go through uh, go through your moves. Um, but before we get into that, maybe you could talk a little bit about like. Well, what were you doing, like, let's say before the pandemic, chess-wise, and then what have you been doing during the pandemic? Um, so that's a very good question for me, personally, because so before I was, like, I think I had finally hit my ceiling before COVID, and I actually, like, I was playing a lot of tournaments, so I'm very experience-based, but, you know, I've never had a coach before. It was always kind of me self-teaching myself, and mm -hmm. then once I hit COVID started, like, you know, I... I'd just come home from university, it ended, so I had like just all this time to focus on chess. So I started like really grinding and trying to get better. Um, just doing books, courses. Um, I had an issue, for me, like the way I approached chess in my youth was very opening focused. I, mm -hmm. I didn't study, you know, it was a very unorthodox way of doing things, so I had all this opening theory knowledge that I didn't really, it was kind of useless once I had people that were able to play the opening out with me, and then I would get to a middle game, and I just would, or an end game, and I wouldn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, in COVID, I've spent a lot of my end game. That was been, that's been a huge thing I've been focusing on. Um, I just got Dibaretsky's end game manual for Christmas. Uh, I'm going to start going through that as well. Uh, oh, cool. So, yeah, I just, it's been, I've started studying a lot more during COVID, um, and I'm waiting for that and so i can test out my knowledge on the board but nice yeah. i know you're also playing a lot so how often are you um how often would you say you're playing like classical games rapid games um in my peak i'm playing probably close to four to seven classical games a month um i'm as i i think i mentioned this to you before the stream started i had a bit of burnout at the end of december so i took a break uh, but I'm, like, getting back into it now. So, yeah, it's going to be around there. I try to play a lot. Cool. Um, all right, I'm just yeah. going to start, like, just going through some of your games. And you're playing white in this one. Um, yes. Let's take a look. Oh, no, I think I'm black. Oh, you're black. You're black. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah let, me, let me flip this here. And, okay. Um... And this was a classical game, right? Or was this... Yes, yeah. This I think this was a 30-minute yeah. game. 30, oh, got it. Okay, cool. All right. So C3, 97, 4, 98. So we're basically playing kind of like a King's Indian setup here. Yeah. Uh, is that what you normally do against, like... Uh, uh, against... Uh, against... Against D4, no, I actually, um, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place right now. I've been playing just um, uh, Dutch mainly, Dutch, and uh, why can't I remember the name of this very common thing? I'm having a complete brain fart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you want to make the moves on the board? Happening? Why is this happening? <laughs> it's like, I've been playing this for so long now. Oh, Nimzo? In Emzo Indian, there we go. Yeah, yeah, Emzo goes and good. stuff. Right, yeah. okay, cool. I don't know if we got that. Oh, I see. But if they start with knight yeah. f3, then... I, I tend to mirror, yeah. Because um, gotcha. I actually play against the French. I'm playing the King's Indian attack now. 
so I normally I have a good like knowledge of it, so I normally mirror it. Okay. And what if yeah. they play something like this? Oh, C4. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd probably go into, like, some sort of Queen's Indian kind of thing with, like, uh, E6, you know, just kind of hedgehog. Because gotcha. the, normally these kind of players are going to go into a ready, and that's what I'm, like, comfortable. Yeah, like this kind of stuff. Um, okay. You know, and they play, like, this, and then here. And I'm playing for, like, you know, C6, or sorry, D6. Knight d7, bishop b7, castles, c5 at some point. Um, yeah, just kind of like a very held back setup until I'm ready to break. Okay, yeah, this is definitely playable. I mean, you could do the same thing um, here. You could go b6 if you want. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so, so that's interesting. All right, so we get this. Um, yeah, totally reasonable structure for black. There's different ways of playing this one. Um, not quite sure about knight e7. What's the idea here? Um, I was just kind of playing normal, like, King's Indian defense theory, I guess you could say. Like, the setup as I know it in my head. That's why I played the 8 next move. So I was thinking bring this back, prep mm. f5 at some point. Um, right. I mean, okay, let's, yeah. let's put the position you're thinking about on the board. So... Yeah, I guess like in typical King's Indian, which okay, we can get from this fancy move order. Yeah, like just the complete classical kind of stuff. Yeah, we have like e5, castles, and then black goes knight c6, white pushes d5, knight e7, and then yeah, right. we have our like knight e8 stuff. So this is yeah, kind of our reference point. Um, yeah. But I mean, in, in the game, I mean, number one, our knight's not, not under attack. Right. Like... You know, with, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my arrows. Arrows can be really tough. There we go. Uh, the knight's not under attack. So this move 97, this is like, I mean, this is a full tempo you're giving up. Um, and yeah, we need to understand why we're actually making the move. Because it's not that the knight is good on e7, it's just that the knight gets hit. You know, the knight is important to push e5, but here white kind of gave us e5 for free. So our knight is kind of standing... It doesn't exactly stand well on c6 because the c3 pawn will um, will restrict it, but uh, it doesn't stand better on e7. That's for sure because on e7 doesn't have a lot of prospects. Um, so maybe I should should have in the first place considered knight d7 instead. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, c6. So, oh, in, instead of knight c6. No, I. Yeah. I, I think knight c6 here is totally fine. Because you're just you're putting the knight in the center, and I mean it's well placed here, even if white plays um, c3. Uh, but then the right. follow up, I think there's different ways to to play these positions for black. But one very reasonable idea is actually just to play for d5, just taking uh, you can okay. play like in the center. But if you wanted to play more of like a king's Indian type of game, then I would I would maybe think about starting with a move like h6. This one is often useful in general. Um, and then you kind of open up some options, like you have knight h7, and then f5. Um, you're also just always controlling this g5 square, and then when it's time to push your kingside pawns, you're kind of already equipped to do that. Right. Um, and uh, so I don't know what white does here. Maybe let's follow the moves white played in the game, like a4, then you could, for example, go back knight h7 here, or knight e8, and then play for your typical f5 uh, counterplay. Right. And then knight on c6 is good, because, I mean, it just, like, restricts white from from pushing the, the d-pawn. So, it, yeah, that's true. it's like, um, I mean, the important thing is, yeah, we got to treat positions, you know, in a very, like, concrete manner. Um, and, yeah, you know, just because one move is good in one opening doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to translate in uh, another position. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, let's keep going. So here, here. Knight c4, f5. Well, I mean, our, our plan is pretty simple. King h8, yeah. d4. Wow. Sharp move. <laughs> I guess that was... Okay, I don't know. Seems... I can't 
can't help but not look at the computer evaluation rate to the left yeah, of the thing. Yeah, sorry, but... that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably just 24. Um, I'm, well, I'm just trying to find the issue with it. I, I'm more interested like, I mean, in what, what, what um, I guess. Yeah, what was like your your thoughts here when I played D4? I know you end up playing B6. So what was kind of your... Yeah, um, I guess I just missed the free E pawn. <laughs> but, I don't know, my, my thought on B6 was just, you know, my other bishop is... I kind of, I think I wanted my other bishop on A6 um, to just try to maybe get a pin on the knight on C4, the rook. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, it's kind of a slow plan actually, I guess. D five at some point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now that you're looking at it, it feels very slow, right? Because white just initiated yeah. this like violence, like so many pawns hanging. Yeah. And B six bishop a six. Right. Um, so you're saying you didn't even see you had f e four. I think I think I probably did. Sorry, this game was a little while ago, but um, oh, okay. I th something that's happened for me is I've been punished by taking pawns at this stage of the game before and just getting crushed. So I, I probably was just thinking, like, this is going to be not a good pawn to take. Um, hmm. Yeah. I and mean, maybe I wanted F... I probably wanted to play F4 as well, which is a pretty good break for black, I think. So, like, you want to be careful about this because, like, again, I think you kind of come back to treating every position in, like, a unique way. It's like, I understand, right. sometimes you get burned for taking pawns and... That means you should be careful about it, but every position is different, and you know it's like you got to evaluate the situations on a case by case basis because there will be lots of pawns that are very good to take, um, especially if you get to take them and like attack something or control some key squares. I would imagine. I mean, it's possible you were worried about um, f e four knight g five. Yeah, which that is, kind of stuff. I mean, usually kind of like the idea. Although I'm not even sure if White saw that their pawn was hanging. We no way of knowing. <laughs> um, right. And okay, the engine, the engine will find something here, but I think just from human point of view, um... I mean, one idea I kind of have for white is, this is just if if white could have the moves they want, you know, say I take on e4 and knight g5 and then play knight b6. Hmm. Hopefully oh, you're for saying knight f7. Take right? on d4 and then what was the line? So say I, no. So say I took on e4. I don't really have moves for black in response, but um, say knight um, g5, mm -hmm. and you know this kind of restricts bishop e6. Maybe I just move a knight out of the way. Um, my idea is kind of knight b6 in some of these lines, but I guess two knights for the rook is not. Yeah, you're giving up a lot amazing. of material there as white. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And in the meantime, yeah, black has black has a move here, so we can like take on d4, yeah, and then push d5, for example, um, right, which looks yeah, looks looks quite uh, quite nice for black. Okay, kind of a miss there, but that's all right. Let's let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, so b6 takes, and we take. Now the game gets crazy. A little crazy. <laughs> I feel like everything you're doing here. Makes sense. And so now position starts to look really good for you. Yeah, I think well, white kind of yeah. self-destructed here a little bit, but that often happens against the King's Indian. That's why it's one of my favorite openings. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so now we're doing great. Ninety six. Take, take. Bishop g five here. C five. Actually, there was something to be said. Did you consider this end game? Queen takes a three. Um. Honestly, I I kind of did, but my I didn't really think. So I thought keeping the queens on because there could be at some point a way to exploit the weak king. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bishop is still bad, but I don't feel I'll be able to hold on to um, that pawn for super long in the end game because. You know, the, that rook is going to come to a3. Maybe they play some sort of b4 set. I don't know, trying to push those pawns and double the rooks on, like, the third file, third rank, and just trying to get the pawn off of f3. Mm -hmm. And I felt it's just easier for them to attack. It gives them a point. Like, they're kind of dictating what's going on in the game in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, I can create counterplay, but 
So I just thought maybe keeping the queens on because the end, I'm, the middle game is still highly favor favorable for me. Uh, I move the queen out of the way or play c5. Their queen's on a horrible square. Uh, my bishops keep dominating, stuff like that. I see. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I'm not sure if it's the right decision because it's like here, um, uh, I guess when we keep the queens on for the attack, it, it is kind of like a speculative decision. Like we don't know exactly right how we're we're breaking yeah. through like i would understand if you had a direct plan like bringing the queen over to h5 or something like bishop h3 yeah. um not sure i mean i think you're definitely clear like much much better in both cases actually i think it's just an interesting decision because in the end game i yeah. feel like um i don't know maybe it relies I, I on this move bishop yeah. c4 like to kind of fix white structure a little bit this one does look very very ugly for white with the uh f3 That's pawn true. Because it's just a very difficult pawn yeah. um, to deal with. And, like, white's rooks are now kind of scattered. Maybe bishop e2 or something. You know, rook comes to e8. Um, right. I don't know. Yeah, just a thing for me also is I've always been more comfortable with queens on the board. Like, I like playing with my queen rather than without. So that was probably a factor as well. I see. I mean, that's possible. Yeah, we all have, like, these yeah. biases. In fact, I might even have yeah. kind of a similar bias because I do like to attack as well. Um, yeah. What I would say, what's kind of helped me in, in this is that, like, um, I guess you have to kind of understand the decision that you're making. So if you take the end game, it's like maybe 60 40. 60% 60 you win, 40% you draw. Sometimes you'll like blunder and like right. lose, but we'll just kind of, that can happen anytime. Um, whereas if you take the attacking position, it's more like, I don't know, it can even be like 50 50 win lose. And right. So then it's like up to you to decide. Like, you want 50 50 win lose, or do you want 60 40 win draw? And then once you kind of put it like yeah. that, it's like, well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or even if it's like 50 yeah. 50 win draw, you know, it's. Um, right, right. It, it's still a very, very clear uh, decision. Although I would say this one was not that, that clear. I would say this is like. If you go for the end yeah. game, 50 50. If you keep queens on the board, like maybe 50% win, 25% draw, 25% loss. Yeah. Um, but, uh, okay, it doesn't mean always trade queens, it just means, like, you know, the, the decision is yeah. a serious one, and okay. a lot of times it's all about, like, sometimes there's no wrong decision, it's like, you're better with queens on the board, and you're better with queens off the board, it's just a matter of, yeah, which one is kind of more straightforward, although I feel like you won this mm -hmm. one really quickly, so, I'm not even sure if this is worth <laughs> discussing. Yeah. Game ended actually. Takes takes here. Yeah. Oh yeah. I had this tactic. Because I just. It's right. Oh H six. Where I am kicking the bishop. Okay. So I mean, actually, I think your decision worked out totally fine. Um, yeah. I think maybe just particularly because of the queen position of like White's queen position is pretty bad. Yeah. And yeah. My no, bishop no, is kind of keeping it from getting out and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, this this works out really well, actually. A, uh, this should be two, a five, h six, and takes takes. No, just the, yeah. And back rank, yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's well, jump the rhythm to... rock and the bishop. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's look, jump to the yeah. um, next one here. Sure. Um, okay. This game, I think you're playing white. I believe so. I can't see it on the top. It's saying it's the same game. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely I'm definitely white this game. Okay. Because it's the it's the French, and I played the KIA. Right. Right. All right. So yeah. so this is your main main opening against the French. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, I just started picking it up more. Do you also do it against the Sicilian? Uh, no, I normally play like Rosalimo slash Canal Attack against that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Because you can also play yeah. these kinds of setups uh, <clears throat> against the Sicilian as well. Yeah, Especially um, E6 Sicilians. Totally possible. Right. Cool. So Knight H2. Wow. I, I, <laughs> yeah, it's already worked out, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of what you suggested last game. Oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> With yeah, the it's three, two. Yeah. Now a three. Okay, a three just stopped night before. That's that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Because I 
I kind of was using some Dutch intuition here with Queen E1. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that a thing? A6. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, in the Dutch, just to play Queen E8, Queen E8 you have to figure out like how you're going to stop the knight coming to I mean, mm-hmm. B5 or B4 in mm-hmm. this situation. Usually I would do it with C6 or C3, but because of this, like the way this setup is, I need to play A3. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Now the, the bishop on H5 actually is kind of awkward for black. So, yeah. So you already have... Um, Nice position here. Uh, okay, so knight c4, rookie eight, five. I mean, things look great. Wow, you didn't take on h6 here? Oh, because of knight h5. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, take knight h5, you go here, and then if knight f6, you go queen g5? No, I, it's mate. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so queen g4, then what's the problem? Um, Maybe g6, but that looks good for white. Yeah, yeah, I don't understand why you didn't take the pawn. Mm. Yeah, I just kind of... I don't know. I just missed the idea. Okay. Uh... Like I saw that, but... I just kind of thought knight h5. Maybe if it was... Th- yeah, I think I wanted to play bishop f3 first. So that there was no knight h5. Okay, to be fair, you actually had seven minutes at this point. So you're kind of in time trouble. Then the question is, wow, where did you burn all your time? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, have to, I can check if you oh, want. Oh, okay. No, I, I have the game open. That's why I was looking. Okay, apparently oh, okay. you spent all your time on knight c4. You spent like... 20 minutes on this move. Uh, let me go back. Yeah. Um, That's cause, a lot. Yeah, because I was trying to, I mean, I either, I, I knew I wanted to move the knight because I need to start, you know, building a little more pressure, I mean, a little more defense on the f4 pawn. And, as you mentioned, the h6 pawn, like, opening up that diagonal. And I was trying to decide between b3 and c4. Um... I just kind of I do that at times when I have these two decisions that look you know kind of similar and will play ha- play out a little sim- more, like in the same ways. I think a long time because I am trying to and I calculate lines deeply, so I'm like, will this have a repercussion? This many moves down the line. So I was really like, I don't know, particular about thinking here. Yeah, but you gotta understand, you're kind of um, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot a little bit because. You have yeah. 29 minutes, right? I mean, G30. Um, so, so far, you're, yeah. you've managed your time really well because you've played pretty quickly and all your moves kind of follow, like, the, the logical plan. Um, but then at this point, I would say the situation hasn't really changed that much. It's still kind of a semi-quiet, but, it, like, about to get sharp. So, for sure, you have to calculate here, but you also have to recognize that, like, you're not going to be able... Like, the real calculation is going to start, like, five moves from now. And here, you just have to find a way of... Of bringing your pieces in so like i mean to my eyes right. if you play any move knight c4 queen g3 king h1 all these moves are like totally reasonable and i i think okay. your position is good regardless um but uh something to be said maybe just about being a little bit more practical with the, the time management because that might be your biggest mistake in this game actually just spending right. a ton of time because, uh, yeah, in Blitz, you could have made the same exact moves. <laughs> like, yeah, that's true. You know? Uh, so, okay, it's always easier in hindsight, but, I mean, that's, yeah, just just what I noticed. So now we don't have that much time, but now it's, like, the time to uh, to Think. calculate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, okay, he gets out of the way. Knight g4 takes, takes, f6, king f2. Mm-hmm. He gets the square, and now now comes the counterplay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so this, this happens sometimes. It's like you you just try to build up the attack for like a million moves, and then your right. opponent yeah. just and gets back. Uh, do you feel like this kind of thing happens frequently? Um, 
I mean, yeah, like a big thing for me, I've, I've started to work on it a little bit throughout like COVID and the pandemic break, but, um, I, I would oftentimes like just like this game get these really good positions and then throw them away just like I did here um, and just not be able to play them out. Yeah. And that it, went, it actually wasn't taking too long and not having enough time. It was moving too fast, and you'll see that's a trend that probably happens in these other games. But um, right. yeah. this is actually a bit of an anomaly that I took forever. But <laughs> I, I'm usually too fast. Actually, no, that's, that's what I'm used um, to seeing your games. I feel like <laughs> you often play yeah. quickly. But yeah, this one was kind of um, uh, the opposite. And then at this point, basically what happens was like, yeah, you just kind of try to win in a very like mechanical, straightforward way. But this right. is a position that kind of requires like violence, like opening things up. So yeah, yeah engines suggest stuff like G5, which, okay, like has to be calculated. But yeah. I guess the idea is like to, to get bishop H5 and bishop G6 and, and play for mate. Um, but but these are the okay. kinds of ideas that we kind of have to be looking at. Whereas a move like King F two is it's nice, but only if we have if we have enough time. time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here it it was just just ended up being too slow. Um, yeah. But I wonder. Um, could I? Sorry. After yeah. Queen B six, mm -hmm. I wonder if I could have considered B four. My well, probably a better choice. Yeah. Um, just to keep Black's counterplay at bay. So something like Rook yeah. A C8 would follow, and then maybe like Rook C1. You can kind of like... But I mean, this is definitely the way to go at this point. Yeah. Um, but I'm definitely on the back foot at this point. But yeah, now it's... Right, it's like... I may get to the point where I have to take the knight, and then I don't really have a good attack on the dark squares. Yeah, like to break up the pawn chain. Then, then black would just be kind of in in total control. Um, yeah. So right, I would say we've already kind of lost the the thread at this point. Um, yeah. But uh, okay, cool. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, so against Ramona. And okay, oh yeah, this game. Black. <laughs> Unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, so here's a Nimzo kind of. No, not Nimzo. This was a Queen's Indian. Mm -hmm. Queen's Indian, cool, cool. Yeah. yeah, I play this against Knight F3 when they because I I don't really like the Bogo positions. Um. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, so. Bishop G5, E3. Knight C3. So do you typically kind of play the setup like knight d7 and stuff? Yeah, just this really like hedgehoggy kind of. Yeah. Gotcha. Hunkering down. Uh -huh. We kind of changed our mind here, huh? Like queen yeah, seven. I know. I, I shuffled shuffled my queen around a few times. Yeah, definitely should have gotten. Because I thought, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's let's focus on the f two square. And then this was just bad because of this move. Oh, oops. <laughs> wow, I was nice being trick. really cheap. I know. What a great trick. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying, but just queen f3. And, oh no, takes first and then... No, yeah, queen f3. Yeah, just yeah, lose the queen. Know, just, yeah. But no, yeah, no. just defend it. And it's like... <laughs> no, the knight's trapped. But couldn't you have gone back knight f2 here? Um, I mean... Yeah, I guess I could have... <laughs> Because you're repeating the position. Oh, we were too. Oh, I'm blind. Not that <laughs> you you make a draw, but just that. Um, I mean, if if you feel like you're worse, oh, yeah. then you might as well repeat the position and force yeah, your opponent the yeah, there. to find something huh. out. <laughs> Weird mode. So let's see what happened here, because I feel like you were kind of okay, and then all of a sudden. Yeah, it just got bad really quick. I think the queen shuffling wasn't helpful at all. 
that three moves just moving it around. That, that for sure, but I, I think actually it was more about the structure. Like, I, I would say this structure is not fun for black already. Even if objectively right. maybe you can hold it, it's just you have this backwards pawn, open file. It's yeah. like we don't really have a lot of compensation for this one. So my feeling is that maybe either here, either we play f4 and then play this position, oh, yeah. which I think actually could right. be could be interesting because you would follow up with like e5. Mm -hmm. uh, if white doesn't play it, or if they do play e5, then I don't know, but maybe, get, maybe, maybe take just... on f3. Yeah, maybe d5. Oh. Like this. Oh yeah, like this. Yeah. And I think you're, yeah. I think you're okay. Um, yeah. Or maybe just we we don't allow it in the first place and play like knight f6. Right. Yeah. And I mean that's. That's such a thematic, thematic thing for this kind of position, you know. You you get rid of one knight, you replace the other one. Yeah, yeah. When no, you play the other knight. Comes. Yeah, so I feel like yeah, this e four break was something we definitely needed to kind of consider more seriously. But uh, the other question is maybe knight f six here at this point. Did you not like this one for some reason? Like you didn't want to change um, bishops. I think I was just in my head. I didn't want the pawn on e four. Oh, really? Maybe that's... Yeah, I don't know. Because I... Again, like, the whole thing with the target on e4. I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess the idea is you, you could take with the knight here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just mean in the fight, like, where, where I moved it back, I didn't want to just leave it and have the bishop take and the pawn taking, but, yeah, it's knight of six. Right. Hold on. Yeah, the pawn can definitely get weak. I, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. Okay, so... I mean, yeah, f5, I don't know. Maybe might f5 not be right. was... Yeah. Like, the normal way of playing these positions is just to trade on c3, rook takes, and then you bring the other knight to f6, and then you prepare to put it on e4. Um, and actually kind of playing for e5 in these positions, actually. Okay. Um, the f5 plan, like, I guess from the BOGO, it, it's very risky because you are weakening a lot of squares. Right. So this is the plan where, like, you know, they, they castle and then they go for, like, rook f6, rook g6. Um, yeah. So, yeah, actually, you can you have to be really careful with this one because white often just immediately is able to kind of fight back. Right. And then, yeah, the queen shuffling. I looked at d7 after I moved it, and I was like, oh, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Unfortunate. Um, yeah. And then here, I don't know. There's not much I can do that, to stop the knight. Well, there? Hold on, because you have queen f5. You know, if you move your knight somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, what if you go here, and then, like, here, here? I mean, yeah, that's doable. Um, I mean, probably takes. Yeah, they win the pawn. Yeah, oh yeah, right. But, uh, well, I mean, it's, you're not lost yet. Yeah. So, no? that's, that's still very playable. Um, yeah, so... After knight h4, were you thinking it's kind of over because of knight g6? I wasn't thinking it was over. I was thinking I would have to go for a Hail Mary pass and just gotcha. try to throw everything I have left at f2. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and rely on some trick like I tried, but... Yeah. Okay, but... All right, I don't know. Now I'm looking at the, the timestamps for this game. So, yeah, I think this is more of what you were talking about. So, yeah, yeah it's a yeah, g30. It's too fast. On knight h4... You got almost 26 minutes left. <laughs> and then on knight yeah. g4, you spend basically like 40 seconds. So, yeah, that's a critical time mistake. Yeah, yeah. Because if you believe your position is lost, <laughs> then you should be spending all your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so it, that that's a big leak. That, that could really hurt you because, like, there are so many moments in chess where you have a move, 
but it's not obvious like what it is but it does exist in the right. position you just have to spend the time uh to find it so it's very important like a not to give up kind of like like relax on the position whether you think it's like totally winning or like totally lost and b to then like kind of hunker down and spend the time and yeah just work on solving the problems at hand because i think you can right. find this queen f5 trick i mean this is really not like nothing groundbreaking i mean you know? yeah i think a big thing for me is when i get into what i think is a loss or like much worse position as i kind of lose the motivation at times so i'm just like just get it over with kind of mentality which is horrible and i need to stop that but <laughs> No, it's it just very, happens. It's very natural, and it happens to yeah. everyone, myself included. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I, I remember, like, well, I learned this lesson when I had a game. Um, maybe I can, I can just, I can, I can pull it up, actually. It'll take, like, two seconds. But, um, sure. yeah, it's really important to, to I, I guess, be resilient um, for a yeah. number of reasons. But, but the main one is that, like, you don't, you don't know for sure that you're lost. Uh, and right. since you're you're gonna be wrong some of the times, you kind of like, you kind of throw those games uh, away because uh, yeah, you don't give yourself a chance to really yeah. figure out the the issues. Um, but also, well, I, I, I had a, yeah, I had a just quickly, I had a massive lesson on something like that um, when I was still playing over the board. So in last year, my first year of university, I played the Northern Ontario uh, Championships mm -hmm. and. I played an actual. Oh, I played an IM first round. Mm -hmm. It's like full on classical, and he got mad at me because I resigned too early. He showed me I had some way. I never would have found this, but I had some way to draw. <laughs> and he's like, I, I resigned too quickly because it was it was this huge thing, and I think he thought I was higher rated than I was, but because <laughs> um, he got paired against a sixteen hundred in the first round. But um, I see. Yeah, it was just like just a huge eye-opening you know like i don't know no i mean it's a really important lesson yeah. um so yeah i'll show you this game real quick uh sure. this is a game i had against um grandmaster uh tiger hiller pearson who's pretty well okay. known and um, i was playing black in this position um right so i guess maybe you, you might want to flip it just to see it from from my perspective yeah. but yeah. basically i was like kind of holding for most of the game, I was definitely worse. And then we got into this end game where I felt like I was still worse, but like kind of um, kind of okay because like we have these like two pass pawns on the queen side, and um, these are these are no joke. Like White has to be careful not to let these yeah for start sure running. Um, so okay, after a long yeah hard fought game, I played ninety seven, and then as soon as I like play this move. Um, I, I realized, like, oh, man, he has h6 check, which is the tactic that, like, well, basically, oh, no. I was calculating on, like, every move to make sure that he never has this. <laughs> but I basically blundered right at this moment, because the, the <laughs> point is takes, knight d6. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then, um... Oh, I thought knight f6. No, knight d6. I guess knight Right. Yeah, okay. because no, rook is it. hanging, and then rook has to defend the knight. Yeah. Uh, and then if I move right. the rook to, like, d8, for example, then knight f7 check. So that's the point of knight d6, if you, or of h6. If he plays knight d6 in this position, I just go rook d8. Everything's fine. We're just trading knights. But he throws an h6, right. takes knight d6, and, like, losing the exchange. Oh. And so I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I yeah. play king f8. And then knight f6, it's it's game over. Yeah. Um, okay, so then after the game, we're, like, analyzing... And then we come to this moment, I'm like, oh yeah, I feel so bad, I blunder. And it was actually the same thing as what happened to you. He was like, yeah, well, hold on. Like, h6, like, you could have taken knight d6, black takes here, knight takes c8. And then actually, I did see this line during the game, like, knight c3, huh. rook a1, and, like, a5. And I basically thought, like, yeah, it's probably losing. Like, yeah, who cares? Um, <laughs> then after you know, we were analyzing this one, and he was like, "Yeah, this is this is not easy, bro. Like, this would be really yeah. like there's so many ways White could mess this up. Like, White could lose this. Like, right. the two pawns running, Black's king can stop the e pawn. You know, White's knight on e8 is weird. Oh, the engine sure. the engine will say White is winning, but like, 
Well, like, yeah, but it's a very probably like one line kind of like critical line kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember analyzing it and like it was quite like not that easy to just find the cleanest way for for white to win. Um, yeah. And basically, the point was like you know this mistake of giving up was actually a bigger mistake than missing h6. Because you're always going to miss these kinds of tricks, but then the the players who are able to kind of bounce back and just keep fighting all the way through, these are the players sure. that end up being the most successful. Because it's not like Magnus has never had a bad position. He's had a lot of bad positions, but he's one of the best at yeah. like defending and like finding resources and um, just making the most out of his chances. Yeah. There is one game we'll look to, at tonight that yeah, I had so oh, many somewhere. moments I wanted to design in, but... Like I just, uh -huh. I didn't because it was I, I it was a training game against a titled player and I wanted to, you know, use that experience. But mm. yeah, so many times I wanted to resign. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but see, guys, it's not like uh, I, I see the folks in the chat. It was uh, it's not oh. just the it's not about like actually resigning too early. What happens for a lot of players is that you like you mentally resign you're like oh the game is yeah, over exactly and then you just make the rest of the moves out on autopilot and then and yeah. then you resign like when you're like down a rook or something but um, yeah for sure yeah yeah the yeah and it's like when you mentally mentality. checked out when you mentally checked out like that it's hard to really get yourself back into playing at full strength and stuff like that right and then it goes the other way as well it's, if you're like totally winning it's very easy to just like relax and start making moves exactly. on autopilot yeah. And yeah. I think it's actually the exact same. It's like two sides of the same coin. It's just the exact same and skill. I had, a, I had an exact moment like that. I was playing the last round for a tournament, and if I won, I was going to get first place and a bit of prize money. Mm -hmm. And I was up a pawn in a queen rook ending. It was like three against two on the king side. And I just kept pressing and pressing. And it was definitely a draw, but I was overconfident that I was going to win this. And I just hung my rook like... Because I no, what happened was I touched my queen and my rook was on free. And yeah. I just plundered my rook for free and was lost. <laughs> but, and how much time yeah. did you have at this point? Oh, this was, I was down to seconds. This was like, I think we were on like the fifth hour of the game. Oh, like well, okay. Game. I mean, if you're in, if you're in time trouble, yeah. I think yeah. that's understandable. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're always yeah. going to, those, those situations are always going to be crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's super, <laughs> super volatile. Um, but uh, okay, let's let's go to another game. Um, sure. Okay, how about against? Uh, it's Rachel. Okay, yeah, this is the. This is against the title player. Oh okay, and this is about uh, eighty moves. <laughs> are you uh, are you a Karakon player? Is this your main main opening? Um, I was playing it around the time that. I played her, and uh, I wanted to try. I've been, I had been wanting to try out this line, this isolated queen pawn line. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not? Again, I kind of play everything. Um, my main opening is this Feshnikov. Oh, wow. I think you saw the game I played against Mitch. Uh, probably, um, yeah. And I actually, in one of David Simel's, I had. This is like my famous mess up. I had mate in three. I'm, I'm mate in one against him three times. But I was focused on his queenside pawns that I tunnel visioned and didn't mate him. I remember that. that came out of the oh, yeah, I, I was, didn't realize that was you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was me. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I just like, yeah. It was bad. Interesting. Um... Yeah, actually, I remember just briefly playing through this game. Right. So this was the moment I was most interested in. This d4 yeah. takes queen e6. Yeah, what, what was the idea uh, with all this stuff? Um, okay, I honestly, I can't remember the blunder, but I thought that this d4 move was actually horrible. I think it was because of takes and then... Oh, I'm trying to remember my idea. Well, like based on the time usage, this is what happened. Like you spent maybe ninety seconds on d4, white took, yeah, and then five minutes on queen e6. So something happened. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, 
Or maybe it wasn't a blunder. I think I started realizing the king position of her, like her king position. And if I wanted any counterplay, I would need to focus on that. Maybe trying to exploit it. Um, you know, maybe try to get it to my queen to h3, hence queen e6. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know. But then d5, you didn't give queen h3 check to yeah. play queen d6. I didn't. So, because I I got scared of the running pawn. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. <laughs> so was your original it's... intention to just take on d4? Yes, which is that. See, yeah, there's the blunder. I missed this. Oh, uh, he's on a g4. A g4. Yeah, I saw gotcha, this after. Gotcha. Oh, okay, okay. And okay. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I see. So I need other play. The first two minutes of my thought of my like thinking for queen e6 was two minutes of regret and then three minutes of thinking oh, okay okay that's what i didn't quite get so yeah. d4 then that was the blunder yeah and this was a full-on 90 plus 30 yeah yeah but at this moment you're like at yeah. 15 minutes i mean it's like a, it's a tactical yeah. blunder i would i, I would, like yeah. i don't fault you yeah. for playing just... this move in 90 seconds because you don't actually have that much time and it is it is a reasonable right. move um yeah but okay it is yeah tactical Tactical error. I got it now. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. We, let's actually want to go back through this one, play through a little bit slowly. Um, yeah, this is a pretty interesting line in the Carol. Yeah, I mean, I'm not like a huge fan of, of the IQP, but okay, I think it is it is okay. Now, normally I felt like they always try to keep the bishop, like bishop d6. Do you have any thoughts about this one? Um, I mean, for me, like... I wanted less pieces to be able to blockade on d4. So I thought just trading off a pair of... And then, I don't know, maybe the rook's on a bad square. And I have, you know, castles knight of five kind of ideas. She needs to still develop her knight to d2, which is not a great square. So I thought maybe... I don't know. And I think also I wanted to recapture with my uh, e7 knight onto f6, onto c6 if... She took. Um, I'm just realizing now there's the tactical shot that protects d5, but... <laughs> no, but bishop c6 um, definitely we want to take with the pawn for a number of reasons, but mainly to strengthen our own pawn. Because this will be an improved... Right. This is an improved structure for black, because now you don't... It's much easier for you to defend c6 than to defend uh, d5. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, but yeah, on IC6, there's also the added problem of, of the e-file. I don't know. I actually think, like, I mean, the, the general wisdom when you're playing with the IQP is that you don't want to trade minor pieces. Um, right. Because the more minor pieces you trade, the easier it is for white to use their heavy pieces to just, like, pile up on the d-pawn and then take it. Right. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure about this line. I'll just tell you what line I'm kind of thinking about. So, in the French, there's a very similar variation. In the knight d2, um, c5, where white takes on d5, black takes oh, with the pawn. Oh, yeah. That's rash. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And then we essentially get the same exact structure with kind of slightly different move order, but almost the same exact position uh, by transposition, something like this. Um, right. And then, at this moment, when white goes knight b3, it's very important for black to play bishop d6, because if they play bishop b6 they get it with bishop e3 and here black doesn't want to trade bishops and then if you go bishop c7 there's like bishop c5 so there's like some annoyance annoying stuff here but the the basic point is that in, in this line black definitely doesn't want to trade the dark squared bishops because this bishop right. is just really useful for your counterplay especially like on this diagonal it can be very annoying uh for white right um so, I don't know. Something to there's think about. No, there's no, sorry, there's no bishop f2 there in that pass position, was there? The French one? Um, it's queen b6. Like when the knight is still on oh, b2, that, right that, here. That's right. Yeah, I think white probably should go knight b3 here. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. For okay. one, there yeah. there was this. Because I, I saw the, the, the engine go crazy, and then I. Oh, yeah, yeah. Simply, <laughs> I just quickly saw the. It's like, wait. <laughs> Gotcha. But yeah, knight b3 first. Yeah, I often ignore it because it like it'll swing. <laughs> but no, no, Th this yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so right, white goes knight b3, and then if we played this one, which looks like totally reasonable, um, 
then oh well, actually here it's so interesting here actually it doesn't work anymore because there's going to be knight d2 or knight d4 yeah yeah and that's i realized that after but i just thought with the knight still on d2 right right, right. that's got it yeah, yeah 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 um but now now we just run into the same issue so we should be three and then we don't want to trade bishops and then we get hit with this bishop c5 and so long story right. short it's better for black uh to pull back to d6 in this case so that's why i'm kind of thinking in your case it also would make sense um, right yeah to pull back but okay anyway I, I think we're still kind of okay here uh especially like knight a3 yeah, yeah it strikes i me thought it weird mm -hmm. um i don't know what the idea was maybe yeah i don't know so we go a6 back knight g6 and do we play a6 because if we play knight g6 here, you were worried about white taking on c6? Yeah. Again, I just, I don't know. I didn't, in my head, I didn't want the pawn on c6. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I think this is a better structure yeah. for you. I, I'd be much more, yeah. much more comfortable here. Um, no, I'm definitely, def I'm for sure comfortable here. Um, yeah. Or at least not uncomfortable. Yeah, I think this a6 move was probably not needed. Right. Um, but okay, so here we take, take b5. And then, yeah, what's the idea behind b5? To play push b5? Um, b5, I wanted to stop c4. Because I thought that could be something in the future. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I starting to feel the, <laughs> I guess the uncertainty. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, C4 yeah. It would be a great move to see. If it, if it, like, if White's next move was C4, I would just let them make an, like, I would be like, go ahead, you get to play. <laughs> because C4 <laughs> lets you trade off your weak, weak pawn um, if you want that's to. True. It also lets you push forward, like D4, which would also be good. That's true. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, so yeah, this seems kind of uh, I don't know, kind of impulsive because now the now this structure is weak. Now when White goes knight c two, he hits you with a four. Now you have more weaknesses right. to kind of worry about. So that's kind of the the problem here. Um, hmm. So okay, here takes, and now White has I think really fantastic position because now he's like traded off multiple minor pieces and. It's very easy for him to just kind of pile on um, the the deep pawn. Okay, so but you got you got at least you got your setup. Queen g6. Yeah, you yeah. have some like I got a counterplay. Some counterplay exactly. Ninety one. Knight c4. Six. It's now and honestly, with... I think this was a, a slightly other idea behind b5. Is you know, the knight coming to c4 eventually. Like, it wasn't like, okay, I want the knight on c4. It was just something that came out of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then what happens here if white takes the pawn on d5? Uh, there was rook takes e1. Oh, of course. Just take. Yep. Nice. And. Yep. Cool. So b3, knight went back here. Rook d2. Oops. Cool, yeah, now we're like kind of already. Yeah. F4, fantastic move of, to see. Yeah, no, F4 was really good. She's a very sharp player. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, F4 was a good move for, for black. I mean, oh, really, for black? Well, no, I'm really happy that white weakened themselves, yeah. I mean, this, this weekend. I thought it was good. I thought it was okay for white. Well. Well, no, here, actually, I think we, we kind of, well, we self-destruct a little bit because we go for this d4, but uh, white actually yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't really have much of anything here because um, as weak as your pawn on d5 is, your pieces are super active, and now white has their own weaknesses to worry about. Right. Like, now white can basically never take on d5. Um, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I think you just basically just kind of jumped the gun a little bit on this one. I mean, yeah, I, I just, I totally missed the tactic. 
Yeah. I thought D4 would have been really nice here. Um, I don't know. Because yeah. I wanted to trade off, obviously, and then just have a... Because I'm, I'm kind of okay with the draw. Right, right. This night move, I just... I saw it, I saw it pretty <laughs> much right after I, I played... Before. What can I say on like I mean it's not it's not the most obvious trick, uh, for sure. Yeah, so I, I don't know. It'll happen. Um, uh, that does curse. bring up a interesting point. How do you work on your tactics and, and calculation generally? Um, calculation. I just sit there and look at problems for a while. Um, tactics. The thing for me is like I hate doing puzzles online. It just I don't know. Something about it really tilts me sometimes. <laughs> so I have to do them out of a book and mm -hmm. you know I only have a few tactics books and I've kind of exhausted them so I'm trying to find other resources I have I got a few new things for Christmas but um, yeah so it's just I, I'm very particular about where I like to get my tactics from I don't like I don't like the chess uh, the Lee chess ones very much uh, chess.com you have to pay for it obviously yeah, yeah, I'm not a fan yeah. of the online trainers. Um, what about like Chessable? Because they have a lot of like books on there. Um, anything I can get for free, I'll do. <laughs> oh, okay. I see. Um, so like, I mean, it'd be a dream to do the woodpecker method, but I just like it's what at least a hundred dollars. I mean, they uh no, no no the book it's like twenty or thirty bucks. Um, yeah. But uh. Well, like like most books are. I think it's just the video courses that are are pretty expensive. But um, uh, I for well, they actually they do have some free tactics courses. Uh, so you <laughs> you could try those. But there's also like Chess Tempo, yeah. which I'm not a huge fan of. Um, I've what, used that. I use that for end games. Chess Tempo. Oh okay. I think their end game calculation is good. Um, it's helped me a lot there. But Interesting. yeah. Um, Again, uh, like just like you, like the online tactics training is just kind of not for me. Yeah. What about like CTR? Have you tried the uh, the app? I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. I'll send it to you. Uh, it's <laughs> I did a video on it for for Dojo's channel. CTR. It's like it's just a good <laughs> tactics app that I really like. Cool. Yeah, um, I'll check it out. Because so the the problem with the online trainers is that they have all these problems where the engine just kind of like comes up with the solution. And it's right. like, I'll, I'll, I yeah, exactly. They're just not that like. Useful. And and a lot <laughs> of the positions, especially with lead chess, is like, there's multiple answers. Like, they'll get you to the same thing, oh, but if I you see. do one, you're pu you're punished for not doing the most correct one. Uh huh. And it's like I don't know. It's a very as you're saying like engine heavy way of thinking where it's like you have to play, the one winning move like the fastest winning move all the time. Right, I but the it's cool thing about conditions do wrongly. CTR though is that like on the app it has like this built-in engine, and so if you suggest them, because yeah, there there are times where you make a move, um, and like there are multiple winning moves in the line, and if you just make one of them, then it gives it to you. It's like yeah, this is an alternate move. Good job, and that's it. <laughs> so, right, which is how yeah. it should be. Yeah, for <laughs> like, sure. Like yeah, exactly. Um, like if it wins, it wins. Period. Yeah, it also goes back yeah. and like lets you play out against multiple variations, which is really, okay. really cool. I did hear cool. Lee Chess revamp their puzzles, though, so it might be different now. I haven't exactly checked it out. Yeah, um, as I said, I've been away for a little while, but I'll have to look into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. okay, the bigger point here is that tactics, though, are extremely important. Um, right. Basically, for all parts of the game and for, <laughs> for all players. Uh, yeah. So you do want to be working on your calculation and i feel like that might might even be the most important thing for you to work on right now um just because i don't know i, I get the feeling like your understanding of chess is pretty solid yeah and I, like i've i've been playing for years so i definitely have the experience side like there's not much i haven't seen in terms of ways i can lose quickly <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but yeah just calculation um not being lazy at times and then yeah, like tactics. And then it's, again, like my other thing is converting good positions. I actually do better when I'm defending. I love defending. That's, hmm. I actually prefer to play the black pieces because for that reason. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, something we'll have to think Tactical more shot. about. But, um, yeah, it definitely feels like 
you have to work on kind of the practical side of things like time management knowing when to calculate what to calculate a few moments so far yeah were you being um kind of like indecisive and then like changing your mind from one move to the next yeah which right. is it's not always a bad thing but yeah you don't see strong players doing this too often they're often like choosing right. a plan and just committing to it even if it's bad and only shifting away if like well, for example, they miscalculated something, you know, then you have to yeah. adjust. But um, but the thing is that they don't miscalculate very often. It's, it's a very rare occurrence. Um, right. So this is why calculation is always in the background of the game, because there are so many moments where, yeah. like, if to find the right move, you have to see some trick um, or you have to see that your opponent's trick isn't working. And right. the, uh, learning to kind of pick up these little details, it really it, it takes a lot of... Uh, practice. So this is why working on your calculation, solving like simple tactics, simple puzzles is um, really important. Actually, another good book I'll just mention is um, Combinative Motives by Maxim Bloch. That's a pretty, it's a classic. Um, it just has thousands of, well, I don't know if thousands, but at least a thousand good <laughs> exercises in there, good good tactics. Yeah. Um, okay, we have one more yeah, game sure. I want to play through. I think you won this one. Yeah, oh, I think this thing was my game against Jeff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you're playing... Yeah, no, I'm proud of this one. This was a one better one I've had in recent past. This was a nice game. I remember, I think I watched this one. I think this was on the stream. Um, yeah, uh, it might have been. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, here's my canal attack that I've spent, I spent a lot of time on in my youth. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah. I see. C4... So here we end up going for the end game. Yeah. So what was your um, thinking here? Here, my idea was just the space on the king side. I was thinking, you know, okay, g4, f4, um, which I kind of did. Mm -hmm. Just g I was not expecting g5. That kind of caught me by surprise. So I played h3 g4 like g3 g4 to stop knight, knight f4 right right um yeah i mean i guess g5 is... is just to stop f4 but yeah the knight's a little dominated mm -hmm. um and then yeah i remember this moment i thought was weird because you're kind of willingly giving yourself um, well i think out here my idea was the fact that the double pawns aren't that bad and my king will actually be pretty good on e4 it's hard to hit the king they don't he doesn't have a light squared bishop um the knight is not really going to be able to get to a good score to attack it, so I thought the king would be really good there, centralized until I'm ready to activate it in the end game, or the end end game. Yeah. Um, and you know he had the file, so getting rid of one pair of rooks was good. I thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I gotcha. Huh. No, it ended up being really, really interesting. Um, the way you play this. So yeah. Here, here maybe five. Six. Six, six, and then B4. Yeah, I really like this move. Yeah, well, just trying to, you know, get the bishop on a better square. Like, it's just, I think my bishop wasn't great here. Because I could put it on A5, but it's not really going anywhere. And yeah. I have a hard time attacking the G5 pawn at the moment, just because I have a pawn on E3. Mm -hmm. So G4, B, B4 just kind of opens things up. Well, yeah, so, like, this move, I mean, it it shows your, like, kind of... Because it, for the moment, the knight is on a8. It's like you got to do something right at this moment if you want to get anything in this yeah. position. And, um... Yeah. You know, it poses some very difficult problems for black, and then he ends up going wrong um, immediately. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. Just taking on, taking on c4. Didn't seem great. And, um... Yeah, all this was was really well played. I don't know, man. Maybe you should be playing more end games. I mean, this feels yeah, like your no, best we'll played game that, so far. That's, <laughs> that's been my my focus in COVID has been end games. Uh huh. I've literally gone through the entirety of um, what's his name? Man, I'm short on names tonight. Um, the end game manual, not end game manual, the end game course. Oh, Silman. Silman? 
Oh, yeah, that's a good I, like I've, I've grinded through it and I'm starting it again soon. Just uh-huh. going through all the games again. Um, and have you read any books on like yeah. um, practical in-game play, like in-game strategy? They kind of show like, you know, like typical in-game situations. I've I've read like tidbits, like articles. Um, my my knowledge, like the way I acquire knowledge, is just very specific. Like I'll be thinking about a very specific thing, and then I'll go search that up. Um, it's less about like being general. I've always been like very, so I'm good at like in like very specific things in chess, and other things have massive holes in them for that reason. But hmm. I found they kind of balance out. Maybe a little less so as I've gotten a little stronger in rating. Um, I see. Know. Yeah. Yeah, you've got an interesting case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, the fact that I started with openings definitely kind of screwed me over a little. Uh, and what um, do you mean by that exactly? Like, how, how like would you study I, in the past? So I literally would just study opening theory and, you know, beat my 1,200 comrades within 15 moves just because they wouldn't know a trap in a 15-move line. Nice. Like, not 15-move line, but, like, I don't know, just I'd get these positions that were just too good to throw away. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. And if... Just um, what I focus If you were going to, like... How are you spending your time these days in terms of, like, working on your chess? Like, what exactly are are you doing um, or, like, so wanting for, to do? I, mm-hmm. I kind of was going on a very strict schedule. I was doing about 15 hours a week of chess. Um, and again, that was mostly end games. So I kind of have like modules, I guess you could call them. So I do like one topic for like a long time. I actually asked you about this earlier last year. Uh-huh. It was in chat and a chat. I asked you personally, what would you recommend as a good method of training? Mm-hmm. You said, okay, do it in like blocks. So do this for a certain amount of weeks and then do this for a certain amount of weeks. And I started doing that. Mm-hmm. And my last session was end games, so I've been I was doing that for about four months. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, fifteen hours a day on end games for not a, not a day, in a week for four <laughs> months. I see. Uh, I've worked a lot. Yeah. And so that was my. Do you want to keep doing that, or do you do you think like now you should be moving on to maybe something else? I think I can move on. I'm obviously I'm not going to just drop it because end games are highly important. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what my next course of action should be, I guess. Okay, I, I got it. I, th- yeah. I think I'm kind of getting, like, some idea. My, my feeling yeah. is that um, maybe you can afford to to be a lot more... or You should start working on being a lot more concrete um, in your games. Meaning, like, right. relying on your calculation and tactics um, and... Y- yeah, basically just trying to like calculate more in the position, uh, if that makes right. sense, and, and looking for like more kind of like forced lines. Um, yeah. So, I think maybe a good focus or the next focus I would say would would probably be calculation. I mean, in general, it's just like good to work on it. I think for most players, you can always improve your calculation, and calculation can make up for a lot that you don't necessarily like understand about a position. If you're able right. to just simply figure out like what ideas your opponent is likely going to play and, and and come up with tactical ideas for yourself, like this can just really just be worth quite a bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, my feeling is that is that where you would make kind of like the most um, the most gains in, uh, for your chess. Yeah. So when it comes to okay. like how to work on your calculation, I think. We, we we should talk about it because there's many different things you could be doing. Um, yeah. And uh, I always kind of split it up into kind of two categories. You have your quick tactics. It's going to be like your pattern recognition, like forks, skewers, pins, you know, all these like themes and, and, and motifs, um, basically like puzzle rush tactics. And then right. you actually have your like calculation skill, which is when you're like in a game or you're in some situation you know there might be a best move, but you obviously have no idea what that best move is, and you don't necessarily know like how difficult it's going to be. You don't know how many different lines you have to calculate. 
and you also don't know what the opponent is going to do and it's up to you to kind of find their response right so quick yeah. tactics it's like you just have to find some quick idea and that's it there's nothing to calculate you take something with check exactly. you give another check yeah. and then you win the piece that's it that's the that's calculation just, uh, like initial site kind of thing yeah so this is like yeah. another way to think about this like this could you can call it like um you can refer to like type type one or I think they call it like system one thinking basically like really quick right. reactionary um, then you have your slower calculation which I think is maybe the one to work on uh, because well you're a strong player now and I mean this is where games are going to be decided is whether you can out calculate someone um, yeah. and not a lot of your opponents are going to be blundering simple tactics so it's going to be yeah. you're going to have to calculate stuff uh, in advance um, and, and a lot of times the calculation requires you to see lots of little tactical details along the way. For example, you want to make some move, and then your idea is to basically go for some attack. And then five moves down the line, you, you're not going to know if like it's working or not, but, but maybe you can kind of calculate and see some variations along the way. Um, so I think that would be the one to kind of focus on. So there's different ways to do it. Obviously, books with difficult puzzles are good. Um, so puzzles that take you like 10 to 15 minutes to work through. And the idea would be to spend 10 to 15 minutes on one problem, write down your solution, check your solution against the answers, play through the solution. And then if you missed the problem or if you didn't see all the way till the end, go back to the start of the position or the start of the exercise and visualize the full solution in your mind. Right. So as if you were calculating this exact variation during the game. So you can really see what it feels like to calculate the whole variation, all the variations through and through. Because then you you know, you know have the moves. So it's just a question yeah. of um, visualization. Right. Because, um, yeah, within the calculation process, there's also your ability to find moves, which is just, you know, your, your kind of general skill. And then you also have your visualization skill, which is no less important and also needs to be kind of worked on. Because if you can't visualize the position three moves down the line, you can't calculate. Even if yeah, you well, actually, find the move. Blind, blindfold chess. Um, mm -hmm. I've done a lot of blindfold chess. I guess that's how you work on visual, visualization. That's a great way sense. to work on it, yeah. Um, yeah, I know I used to help out at a club in my city, like my hometown, and I did a blindfold simul once or twice against uh, oh, wow. yeah, cool. the students. I've done... I sometimes will like I'll go online and just play blindfold games. Oh, I see. Um, so your, your visualization might not be might not be too bad then. But Yeah, and you, I have a, I have a fairly strong memory for that kind of thing. Like I can I can close my eyes and I see I can I can see the board. Uh-huh. Like it's not like it's hard to do that, I guess. Oh, interesting. Um Well, yeah, yeah, in that case I feel like you definitely could be using it's more It's just of about that doing the calculation. Games. Yeah. yeah, especially, right, like when I see games and, yeah, you're playing all your moves really quickly, then it's like yeah. that to me indicates you're kind of just going off of your instincts and mm -hmm. not your not your calculation. Yeah, it's the intuition. I was a very, and I, was a very, I am a very intuition-based player. Right. Um, and I think that's what helped me with end games when I was a much lower rated player. Like I was able to intuitively play out, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to intuitively play out a position where, you know, it's four pieces on a board instead of a middle game kind of idea. Gosh, yeah, I think we're now really getting getting the picture. Yeah, you're basically a very intuitive yeah. player. Um, yeah. And uh, I remember, so Agard writes in one of his recent books about, like, different types of players, kind of divides them to, like, intuitive and... Uh, I think what was the other one? I believe it was like logical, which basically means more calculating. Right. Um, and basically on intuitive players, the idea is that you kind of get a lot for free. So there's a lot of things that come uh -huh. naturally to you, like you kind yeah. of know where to put the pieces. But then when it comes to like the hard stuff, you don't want to work. You're kind of the lazy, <laughs> the lazy player doesn't yeah. want to. Yeah, no, um, so, so typically intuitive players, I, I'm also an intuitive player, so I'm speaking for myself here, yeah. kind of struggle with like uh, king and pawn in games where there's like a lot of like, you know, uh, moves to calculate and one little detail can right. change stuff. Um, yeah, for me, definitely the major piece in games are where I'm stronger. Mm. Maybe because that's just what I've studied or again, the intuition, like, I don't know, I've like... In a queen pawn endgame, that's just 
my home court. <laughs> I feel the most comfortable there. Interesting. Interesting. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, queen and pawning is a, a, maybe it is kind of more intuitive just about knowing where to like yeah. where to put the queen. Whereas king just and pawn endgames, it's and like stuff. it's literally just all about calculation. You know, in fact, yeah, that's that, one wrong move and you're lost. <laughs> honestly, if yeah. if you really wanted to eat your vegetables, you would go work on some king and pawn end games. But I don't like giving yeah. this advice because I think it's it's not very pleasant, and I personally don't like doing right. it, so I wouldn't say you, you have to do it. But, um, yeah. well, if you ever get to uh, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, I mean, he has a very extended chapter on King and Pawn Endgames. I'm sure that would be... Um, I'm sure that would be extremely challenging. Uh, not yeah. necessarily the thing you have to work on, but that would give you a, a good indication of, like, the types of problems that you're going to struggle with. And, and those are probably the ones that... Right if you work on that, then that's going to give you the most benefit for your, your overall chess. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you when I was around, like, I, I want to say maybe 18, 1900, 2000, basically very similar to your level. Like I, I would say I was a very intuitive player myself. I was playing like D4 and uh, just kind of playing for like, you know, positional chess, trying to like outplay yeah. my opponents, create some weak squares, put my knight there, win a pawn or something, grind them out in the end game. But then w whenever the situation got tactical, I would immediately, like, collapse. I just wasn't concrete enough. I wasn't able to kind of, like, match my right. opponents in, like, the hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so only once I, yeah. like, really started, like, taking it seriously, like, I broke out the Dvoretsky um, and, like, started working through the problems, just, like, calculating at the board, like, suffering, looking at the solution, trying to visualize. It's a really grueling process. But, like, four yeah. weeks of, like, tough calculation you'll really like rewire your brain you'll you'll just feel like a completely right. different um different yeah player. and like that's that's what i've been trying to you know remedy in the last months is just being more focused on actually studying and not like just you know hoping that i can intuitively play my way out of a bad position yeah because you won't um, lose your intuition <laughs> i i, try, yeah, I guarantee yeah. you like honestly it will just help It'll just help you. you know when you watch yeah, a guy like more. um so like jesse for example when he's doing commentary uh he has so much experience he has just like an incredible intuition right because he understands the game oh, at yeah, a very sure. deep level and and so now like that makes it a lot easier for him and other gms to calculate because the right moves come to them and then they know what to calculate but yeah. then they go and do the work and they calculate um yeah. so your your intuition will always help you uh, but it, it, yeah, it does feel like maybe this is the one, the one aspect where you can really, um, really improve things. Just your, your concrete side. Um, okay. So that means solving puzzles, like setting them up on a board. It could also mean um, going through the games of a very tactical player, someone like a Tall or a Shirov or a Kasparov, and um, right. especially Kasparov, super concrete, very. Um, calculating player he just saw lots of variations he he had a powerful intuition he knew like what to sacrifice and like where his pieces should go but he would always justify his thinking with variations so that right. could be a really interesting player to to study maybe just look up some videos you know i, I know you said it has to be free like yeah. uh, there's tons of youtube videos people analyzing kasparov's games watch the video right. pause the video <laughs> and think you know yeah. try to uh play some like solitaire chess, you know, try to come up with his, his ideas and then really try to understand the kinds of lines he's analyzing and calculating and how he, how he plays the game. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, okay. I think, I feel like that's, yeah, that, that's going to be kind of my, that would be my, my, I guess my prescription for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calculation. Right concrete stuff um if you need any uh, advice or suggestions on books or courses or stuff you know feel free to just like ping me whenever um yeah sure and um yeah obviously keep keep playing uh as frequently as you're you're playing i think like just these long time control games against strong opponents this is another yeah. opportunity where you test your calculation so this is like a very important part of the improvement process just playing continually especially trying if you're really going to try to become like a more concrete player, then you have to kind of make a very con a conscious mental shift for your games. Like, you know, this game, yeah. I'm going to be calculating every move. I'm going to be calculating on my opponent's turn. 
you know, I'm going to be spending time. Whenever I come up with a move, you know, I'm going to be thinking, what do I expect from my opponent? And then what's going to be my follow up there? You know, you're always thinking one to two steps ahead, watching out for tactics and blunders and things like that. Um, it has to be a very mental shift for you to really right. start kind of like uh, growing as a player. Yeah, yeah, I do have a lot of goals. Um, I want to work towards NM at the moment when nice. COVID gives me the chance. Dude, totally um, doable. Yeah. Totally possible. I mean, you're, you said you're in school, so you're certainly young enough. And yeah, I'm ni- 19. Yeah, um, no, you have you have plenty of time, and you you've played enough yeah. chess where it's like, it's baked in. The patterns are baked in. Yeah. So yeah. you just have yeah, to like. Sure. I've been playing tournaments since about 2014. So. Yeah. No, play, a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the thing to rem- remember is like you still have a long time to go, and if your mm-hmm. next like six months or a year is just like grinding and like calculation, it's like. It feels like a lot of time, like, oh, man, I got to work for so long. But at the same time, like, in a year, you'll be 20 and much stronger. You'll be much, you'll be in much better position than you are now. So it's like, it's actually not that much time once you start looking back on it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, if I think about how long I've been playing tournaments for, just another year. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of players that make the mistake, they're like, oh, man, if I had spent the last, you know, five years or whatever grinding, I would have been a master yeah. by now. But it's like, you have the yeah. next five years. Like, don't yeah, <laughs> don't make the same it. mistake. And <laughs> the five after out. that. Right, exactly. So um, yeah. Yeah. I think I think you have all the tools. It, it is hard work, but it's like, well, it, it, you know, if, you're, if your goals and your motivation are kind of like set and it's like you know what kind of player you want to be like you want to be that like that master that like calculates stuff and like sees tactics and ideas and like like if you have this vision of like the player you want to become and it's like it makes the work a lot more doable right you, you actually just you can't wait to do it it's like you want to wake up every morning yeah. and get yeah. your yeah. your calculation training in so that's uh that's yeah. my well, that's my hope for you um yeah all right, Henry, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. And then um, right. hopefully we'll check in in a couple months and, and see how it's going. And sure. um, I hope you have some. I think that helps also because there's going to be this impending moment where. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that's. Your cost is going to message me and demand <laughs> to know where I am with my chest. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check in. I want to want to see yeah. how you're doing. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I do still have about six games left in the round robin as well. So you'll be able to see me play those. Sweet. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, thanks. Yep. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, Henry. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And um, you can catch the, this full episode and previous episodes over on YouTube, either on my personal channel or on um, probably on Chess24 or Coach S. I don't know. It'll, it'll be somewhere on YouTube. You know, just somewhere. Google it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, take it easy. Have a good one.